My name is Hattie Thomas Whitehead. And my name is Geneva Jones. Okay. And we're first descendants from London Town. On the night of January 11th, 1961, the city of Athens rioted. Two African-American students, Hamilton E. Holmes and Charlene Hunter, were set to begin their semester at the University of Georgia. The first black students to integrate into the nation's first public university. Just past 10 p.m. though, a group of nearly 1,000 students, led by the Ku Klux Klan, swelled below Hunter's dorm, throwing rocks and bottles, unfurling a banner. No arrests were made. Holmes and Hunter were told to go back home. The University of Georgia pays half a million dollars a year, I believe, to, and will send any colored student to an out-of-state university if they wish to go. Thousands of letters were sent in support of the expulsion. Though Holmes and Hunter were eventually readmitted with heavy police escorts, one concerned citizen's advice seemed to have convinced university officials. In late January, Roland Harper wrote to University President Omer Clyde Adderhall that, quote, the campuses of some leading northern universities are now being encircled by disreputable Negro slums, end quote. In August of that year, the city began surveying lands west of the campus in a neighborhood called Linentown. Five years later, nothing remained of the 50 black families of Linentown. In their place were three new luxury dorms for the white students of the University of Georgia. A quarter of the U.S. population was born in the 20 years after the end of World War II. Attendance at the University of Georgia had stagnated for decades, but in the early 1960s, the baby boomers were ready to go to college. Across the nation, campuses scrambled to accommodate new students and new revenue. Urban universities were particularly pressed. Then Provost of Columbia University described, quote, the relationship of students and faculty to the community as requiring the perpetual que vive of a paratrooper in enemy country. This was one front of the war on poverty. But let's back up. In 1952, the Supreme Court ruled in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka 1 that, quote, we conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. A decade later, Reverend King marched on Washington, and in 1965, the Civil Rights Act made unparalleled strides. That much we know. Now here's what isn't told. As in every period of civil rights gains in U.S. history, white supremacy mutated. It didn't just disappear. The latest target was housing, the quickest, most certain way to accumulate wealth in this country. Urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Getting, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is, a, is, is, is an accomplice to this fact. The clearing of black neighborhoods under the guise of urban renewal and modernity had been mastered in American cities as early as the 1920s, but the American Housing Act of 1949 codified the practice, and a 1959 amendment to the bill allowed universities to apply for urban renewal loans from the Federal Housing Administration. The city of Athens wasted no time. That year, Mayor Ralph Snow wrote to University President Adderhall, quote, in an area adjacent to the university campus, we feel we do have a mutual problem that urban renewal would correct. By 1986, over $13 billion would be allocated to displacing over 300,000 American families, including 176 black Athenians, and over 70 universities would receive money for urban renewal into enemy territory. Urban renewal was the catch-all for a panoply of tactics meant to forcibly remove from sight and mind black populations in blighted neighborhoods. By refusing to provide loans, through the unequal implementation of laws such as the GI Bill, and in the case of Linentown, by refusing to pave roads, provide electricity, or extend sewage, cities intentionally created slums to justify their erasure. UGA historian Cindy Hamovich reminds us that policy, not just poverty, resulted in slumming. Cities often pointed to low levels of home ownership or high levels of unemployment to justify the reorganization of slums. But in Linentown, 66% of families owned their homes, and 63% had at least one full-time wage earner. Recalling her childhood, Hattie Thomas Whitehead writes that no matter the circumstances, the people of Linentown supported each other. Linentown had brick masons, plumbers, electricians, and nurses. They drove their kids to school because the city would not send a school bus. One Linentown home also served as a black inn, one of the few places people of color could stay in the city. In truth, only two numbers mattered to the University of Georgia and the city of Athens. 
Linentown was one block away from an expanding campus, and most importantly, Linentown was 100% black. The practice of universities serving as anchor institutions for urban renewal began in the north. In Chicago, 4,000 black families were cleared from Hyde Park for the University of Chicago. In Philadelphia, the so-called pintrification of areas surrounding the University of Pennsylvania led to a dramatic 29% decline in the black population there. In New Haven, where Yale is the largest landlord in the city, low-rent storefronts have been decimated. In Boston, Harvard has purchased 250 acres in the neighborhood of Alston, gentrifying an area half the size of downtown Charlotte. To be clear, universities aren't doing this to be economic bulwarks. A 1993 New York Times article pins this down. The goal for urban universities is to quote, preserve the character of the surrounding community so their campus remains attractive to future students and faculty members. For leading northern universities, preserving the character meant and continues to mean eradicating nearby poverty and the disproportionately black population subject to it. Metal gates encircling universities like Harvard are more than metaphorical. They're fortress-like structures delineating an educational and therefore class-based border. The adjacency of slums serves as a constant reminder of the extractive wealth used to build these ivory towers. For the University of Georgia, the 50 black families were a nagging, unavoidable reminder. What makes the clearing of Linentown all the more insidious is that the University of Georgia is a public university, state-owned and operated. The urban renewal grant application was championed by complicity at the municipal, county, and state level. Ironically, the University of Georgia today has used this very fact to hide behind its actions. The purchasing of land was done by the University System of Georgia, not the University of Georgia. The city of Athens was responsible for clearing the land. Hell, even Lyndon B. Johnson was responsible, because many other cities did urban renewal too, so I guess that makes it all right. Responding to Linentown activists, the University of Georgia has defended its actions by saying that, quote, similar urban renewal projects took place in cities across the state of Georgia and the nation. At the end of the day, the archives tell the full story. President Adderhald sent letters to Senator Richard B. Russell saying that, quote, this project has been developed by the University and the City of Athens, and asking if the project could be, quote, approved and set up at the Washington level. Thank you for your interest in urban renewal was the response at the Washington level. Every single level of government was empowered to dissent. Only Linentown was powerless. So what exactly happened? The Linentown renters were the first to go, given only months notice to move in a city that still segregated housing. It was 1958. Their landlord would give no reasons, but a large sign placed on the cleared land would later explain their exodus. University of Georgia Urban Renewal Area, project number GAR50. The word Linentown shows up nowhere in the records. This is footage of the first white dorm being built, shot in a marketing campaign for Atlanta Gas Light a company supplying many new buildings in the urban frenzy of 1960s. Craswell Hall was the first to go up, even as the rest of Linentown remained intact. Only later would the city of Athens admit that this was an intimidation tactic. Whitehead recalls that, quote, heavy equipment started digging deep horizontal ditches in front of houses, no matter if they were empty or occupied. The open ditches uncovered dangerous scars that testified to the inevitability of a crumbling community. That I was proud to be a At no point did a representative for Athens or the university inform the residents of Lenintown what was happening to their multi-generational, diasporic community. We shall resist until the end. That's gone. They have put it on the ground. They, they, they erased everything they could, but they couldn't erase our memory. We are not dead. We are here. And we are not going anywhere. And Joey Carter is not either. Then they came for the homeowners. Using eminent domain, the University System of Georgia bought 22 acres of Linentown land at a third of the market price. Black families received 230% less in compensation than white families. There were no negotiations, and most families could not afford lawyers. Those that refused to sell were charged between $15 and $86 per month until they complied. Others watched as their neighbors' houses were razed by the city. At least five houses were burned to the ground by the Athens Fire Department, and what the city called training activities. Shown here is the Crook Family Inn on 167 Peabody Street, the last house standing in Linentown. Behind it is the newly built all-female Brumby Hall. 
A year later, the third and final so-called freshman high-rise, Russell Hall, named after the U.S. senator that worked with the university president to clear Linentown, was completed. Only three original Linentown houses were preserved. Transported to the outskirts of Athens in the now predominantly poor minority neighborhoods, the rest were bulldozed and burnt. These were white dorms, make no mistake. Despite the 1961 integration of Hunter and Holmes and the addition of Mary Frances early later that year, there were only five black students at the University of Georgia when the new dorms were built. The rest of Linentown was converted into parking lots and a garden for the students with the mockingly deceiving name of the People's Park. Ironically, less than a decade after the creation of the park, the college newspaper wrote that, quote, People's Park has fallen victim to a lack of maintenance, and possibly to a lack of interest as well. The same terms were used to clear the slums. Meanwhile, the people of Linentown scrambled to afford housing in the city. Many moved to public housing the city had built at the same time the university constructed the dorms, as if in anticipation that Linentown would be funneled and trapped into renting from the very city that had just evicted them. Most Linentown families would never own homes again. Forced into a state of quasi-sharecropping, families like that of Hattie Thomas Whitehead divorced and intergenerational wealth plummeted. Today, the Athens Housing Authority now oversees 12 public housing projects in a city with a 30% poverty rate. The cost of living in these affordable housing projects continues to rise, in no small part due to the land being purchased and developed privately for student housing. Between 2000 and 2015, 67% of all apartments built in the city were classified as luxury student living. As for the university, race relations remain highly fraught. In a community and state that is over 30% black, black students represent just 7% of the student body. No place in the U.S. has a higher disparity between statewide demographics and enrollment at the flagship public university than UGA. And while only 5% of faculty are African American, over half the service and maintenance staff identify as such. The university's problems with race are older than the university itself. Like many other universities in the U.S., the University of Georgia was built on Creek and Cherokee native lands cleared following the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Also like many American universities, early buildings on campus were built with slave labor. In a test trial for what would happen to the residents of Linentown, in the 1920s, the University of Georgia purchased a tract of, quote, unspecified black-owned properties for the safeguarding of the young women in the university's charge. But perhaps no case exemplifies the university's history of white supremacy better than Baldwin Hall. In 1938, the construction of Baldwin Hall unearthed human remains. Though the university kept this quiet until the 1970s, the manager of the Georgia Information Services wrote to a UJ librarian at the time detailing exactly what had happened. Quote, Grinning skulls of colored brothers were unearthed and thrown over the dump. The bodies of Baldwin Hall remained silent until renovation efforts in 2014 confirmed the worst. In total, 105 shallow grave sites were found beneath the building the university knowingly constructing atop a historic black cemetery. DNA testing confirmed at least 30 of the bodies were African Americans from the 19th century. In all likelihood, slaves. Then, in March of 2017, the university hastily reinterred the bodies in a mass grave west of campus in the Oconee Hills Cemetery, without any public forum, We're going to jail? alongside the marble tombstones of prominent slave owners. The case of Linentown then was just the latest iteration of what geographers Joshua Inwood and Deborah Martin have called, quote, the white privilege and racialized landscapes of the University of Georgia. But there is one key distinction that separates Linentown from the University of Georgia's long history of exclusion. Remember Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes? The first building you see when you enter the university's historic arch bears their name, and last year for the 60th anniversary of integration, the main library created a temporary exhibit in their honor. The College of Education has been renamed after the third student to integrate, Mary Frances Early, and a task force was established to rename the 31 buildings on campus with white supremacist ties. A 35,000 pound granite memorial sits beside Baldwin Hall, and UGA has joined the University the Studying Slavery Consortium, and slavery, which is a complicated relationship. And yet, not one word about Linentown. The university has rejected the Linentown resolution calling for recognition and reparations and refused demands to install a marker next to the dorms. There are a few reasons for this. 
Firstly, as Hattie Thomas Whitehead is quick to point out, it was being done in plain sight. And it was all legal. Unlike Southern refusal to follow Brown versus Board of Education, using FHA loans to burn black neighborhoods was backed by law. Forgetting Linen Town and black housing disparities around universities has one final insidious gain. It makes indigenous removal and slavery and segregation seem like pinpricks rather than what they really are. A 400 year continuous program of black and brown physical and intellectual exclusion from public and private institutions of higher education across this country. And that is why the University of Georgia has erased Linen Town from maps and minds for the convenient and satisfying narrative that the problem has been solved. It hasn't. But while the university has pretended to wash its hands clean from the mud of Linen Town, local activists in Athens have been fighting for redress. Composed of Linen Town survivors and descendants like Whitehead, Blassingham, and Crook, city commissioners, UGA researchers, and members of the Athens anti-discrimination movement, what has been called the Linen Town Project has worked tirelessly to earn victories at last for the lost community. When we sit in their faces, and talk about compromise, and talk about how we're gonna figure out something significant to do at some point, some way, somehow, that is white supremacy still. If redress is satisfied only when those who have been harmed say so, then ultimately solutions to the exclusion and destruction of Linentown rest in the hands of those who were lied to, whose houses were arsoned, who were underpaid and racially evicted. In early 2021, the Linentown Project pinned the Linentown Resolution, a memorandum with 20 recital clauses outlining the grievances and seven specific demands. Number one, an acknowledgement and apology from Athens Clark County. Unified Government of Athens Clark County extends to former residents of Athens Urban Renewal Districts, their descendants, and to all Athenians, a deep and sincere expression of apology and regret for the pain and loss stemming from this time and a sincere commitment to work toward better outcomes in all we do moving forward. Done. Number two, a physical memorial on site. The university refuses to place a marker on its land, but the fact that the city owns much of the land adjacent, including small tracks on the side of the road, may be enough. At a recent April Athens commissioner meeting, the design for a so-called wall of recognition was approved. Number three, participatory budgeting powers. The original resolution called for monetary reparations. UGA generates hundreds of thousands of dollars annually from the three dorms, each of which house around a thousand students. Between local appreciation rates of over 1,000% and lost intergenerational wealth, UGA professor of geography and consumer economics Jerry Shannon estimates that the 50 families of Linentown are owed upwards of $5 million. And this calculation doesn't even include lost employment, education, or trauma, such as the Whitehead family divorce. But the gratuities clause of the Georgia Constitution prevents the state or city from, quote, donating any sum to a private entity or individual, effectively preventing monetary reparations. For now, the Linentown Project has settled with participatory budgeting, which would allow Linentown survivors to make recommendations for allocations in the city budget. As the city begins redevelopment near College Ave, in a majority black community once more, such input will be critical. Number four. The Linentown Resolution has asked for the construction of a Center for Racial Justice and Black Futures. We do not have a center here now. We need one. Construction has been hinted to begin late 2022, and a site has been found. But of course, the University System of Georgia wants no part of it. I still invite UGA to come to the table with us. Number five, the historic designation of the three remaining displaced Linentown homes. Number six, new policies to regulate eminent domain use by the University System of Georgia. And number seven, formal recommendations to the Georgia General Assembly that it explore, quote, appropriate forms of reparations, including amending the gratuities clause, which currently prevents the city of Athens from providing any. So this is where we stand. A long overdue apology. To accept the apology. A wall to commemorate educational barriers and housing borders. A black history center. A plea for cash and pocket reparations and an obstinate university. And it's my job to protect and strengthen the special relationship that our university has with the citizens of this state. The reality is this remains a far cry from what many news articles are calling the first act of reparations in Georgia. I never thought that Town would be recognized, period. A campus built on indigenous lands by slave hands buried beneath the very buildings which were cut off from black students a hundred years later, 
has tried to make amends with its history of exclusion and denial. But this fall, nearly 4,000 students will fall asleep each night on top of torched, obliterated ground, where 50 black families once lived. And year by year, an unapologetic university will collect their dues. And the worst part of it is, they're getting away with it. How about them dogs? So step off the Frankfurt, huh? Yo, Fife, you remember that routine That we used to make spiffy like Mr. Clean? Um, um, a tidbit, um, a smidgen I don't get the message, so you got to <laughs> okay. run the pigeon You're on point, Fife All the time, Tip You're on point, Fife All the time, Tip You're on point, Fife All the time, Tip But then grab the microphone and let your words rip Now here's a funky introduction of how nice I am Tell your mother, tell your father, send a telegram I'm like an energizer, cause you see I last long My crew is never ever whack because we stand strong Now if you say my style is whack, that's where you're dead wrong I slay that body and El Segundo, then push it along You'll be a fool to reply the fight is not the man Cause you know, and I know, that you know who I am A special shout out piece goes out to all my pals, you see And a middle finger goes for all you punk MCs Cause I love it when you whack MCs despise me They get vexed, I will next, cause none can test me I'm just a fly MC who's five for three and very brave On top remaining, no home training cause I misbehave I come correct and full effect of all my holes in check And before I get the butt, the gym must be a wreck You see, my aura is positive, I don't promote no junk See, I'm far from a bully and I ain't a punk Extremity of rhythm, yeah, that's what you heard So just clean out your ears and just check the word Check the vibe, y'all 